you know, with any sport, it's the drills and the practicing that gets you good when you're actually in game time. Um, and so it's, I think it's so many applications of the sports uh, metaphor are true for life. You know, it's all of the little things that you do that add up to big successes. And if you're not willing to put in the time to do the drills or do the practices and, you know, believe in the process, you're not going to yield the same level of results. This podcast is sponsored by Engineered Tax Services, a subsidiary of Engineered Advisory, whose goal is to support CPAs and their clients to achieve the highest and best use of time and resources. ETS offers specialty tax services and incentives, which help expand your capabilities and ensure that your clients are paying only what is required in taxes and nothing more. To learn more about Engineered Tax Services, go to engineeredtaxservices.com and mention the Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise podcast to receive project discounts and a free CPA partnership ebook. Hi, everyone. This is Heidi Henderson, and you are listening to the Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise podcast for accountants. I am really passionate about people and the industry. And I truly believe that the accounting industry can do better for both our clients and its professionals. So I'm going to share insights from people who have found professional success and who have managed to balance that with their physical, mental, and personal health. So I hope you enjoy, and I hope you get inspired. Accountants can earn free CPE from listening to this episode. Just visit earmarkcpe.com, download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. And now, on to the episode. Hi, everyone. This is Heidi Henderson with the Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise podcast. I'm so excited. We have Sarah Huddleston today. And Sarah, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Perfect. So a little bit of background, super high level. Sarah is currently the Director of Learning and Development at the Growth Partnership. Now, interestingly enough, that's kind of part of the company that I'm with. Engineered Tax Services or Engineered Advisory actually also owns the Growth Partnership. So we're actually colleagues, but we're colleagues kind of under different umbrellas. And the space that you work in the Growth Partnership uh, is specifically on advising CPA firms on HR-related issues and practice management. But your background is so cool because you have spent a lot of time in the CPA space, but really with HR, which is people related. And I think that is, I don't know, technical compliance is always hard, but I think managing people sometimes can be much harder. <laughs> so with that, Sarah, I would love a little bit of background. Where w Tell me about how, you, really just give, give me your background. Where do we start? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, going way back to my childhood years, I grew up in Williamsburg, Virginia. Most people, if they're familiar with it, have gone there on like a middle school field trip or something. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I grew up there and I went to school at Vanderbilt uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, studied German and communication studies as an undergrad. A lot of people kind of scratch their heads when I tell them that, but it was just uh, German was something I had taken since I think seventh grade on. And um, had a lot of AP credits and decided to pursue that and had a lot of fun with it. Really didn't have uh, career aspirations with it, but mm -hmm. stayed and did a graduate program in the education school there focusing on adult learning and organizational development. Um, and then moved up to New York City where I worked in HR for uh, companies in the education and fashion industries. And then in 2006, moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, where I was the director of HR for a CPA firm for almost 15 years. And the irony is that I had never even taken an accounting class um, you know, <laughs> in school. So um, wow. I definitely had to learn the terminology, but um, it was a wonderful experience. And I'm very grateful for that 15-year um, run there. And um, when the opportunity came along to join the Growth Partnership, I jumped at it because it was a really great opportunity to be able to share that experience and knowledge and also be able to utilize the coaching uh, certification that I had recently acquired. And so that is a sort of snapshot of, of how I got from there to here. Yeah, amazing. Well, 
I know that we're thrilled to have you and we have done some really fun presentations. You and I have worked together on one specific um, presentation. I laughed so hard when we ended up doing this because it was called How to Have Difficult Conversations. And people who knew me from a previous life, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, probably 20 years ago, would have laughed knowing that I was presenting on how to have difficult conversations. But essentially, you built that program and it was amazing. And, and really, our CPA firms that were there loved the interaction and loved the content because it's, that's the hard part of managing people. So you were with this top 200 CPA firm for a number of years in HR. That's really interesting to me. So tell me in that time, what, what were some of the most profound things that you learned from that position? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. I think there are probably a few things. One is that I was building out an HR team and hiring people for that team that were relatively green in their careers. And, um, you know, over the course of, of 15 years, obviously, we had some people come and go for various reasons, but really understanding how to connect with your team, motivate your team, uh, and do it in a very authentic uh, way that still yields very high top-notch results. And I am still super close with all of the team members that, you know, came and went from my team over that course of 15 years. And, you know, it really just gave me good experience on how to build that camaraderie because it it, mm -hmm. it can't be manufactured out of nothing and it can't be something other than genuine. Um, so that was a big part of it. I think also looking at the number of people who are coming out of both undergrad and graduate accounting programs, very technically sound but not really having the experience and the confidence to engage in some of the conversations that ultimately, as they ascended the ranks, they needed to be able to, to do. Um, of course, there were some people who had a natural knack for it, but I wouldn't say that that was the general rule. I'd say that was the exception. And so what was common sense to me with my background was not common sense to people who are coming in with a very technical background and did not feel confident having those difficult conversations or or areas where they just felt like they were in over their heads. The nail on the head saying that when we're graduating these students, we're teaching all these technical skills, but they're really not being taught the soft skills, the emotional intelligence, the communication skills, the relationship building. And, you know, the interesting thing is that to be successful in business, even as an accountant, we're, we're in the, the people business. And you have to know how to communicate. You have to know how to have those conversations with clients, with your colleagues, with your coworkers, in order to really develop those connections with people and to be able to work together either as an accountant for a particular client or together as colleagues on a joint project. And sometimes that's so difficult. One question I had a CPA ask me one time, they said, do you feel like people can change? And I had an answer that I'm curious to hear what your answer would be to that. And, and I'll preface that with saying, do we feel like people can change? Meaning if someone has an extremely introverted personality, can we develop them into something a little different or help push them into a different space? What's your thoughts on that? So, you know, my first you know, response that bubbled up into my mind is yes, absolutely. We may not be able to get that super introverted person to become, you know, the eternal extrovert, but I do think that it's all about what are the small incremental steps that people are willing to experiment with or test out and gain confidence using so that they can get closer to the kind of person they want to be. You know, it's, it's all, I think we, we tend to do a lot of weighing and focusing on the big things that make mm -hmm. change and we discount the small steps we can make mm -hmm. and those are the ones that really add up i mean you think about compounding interest with your 401k you might not notice the deductions in your paycheck which is you know kind of nice but what's even nicer is that you look up over time and you see all of those uh, deposits into your 401k and the compounding interest over time and it's the same thing with behavior change we really should value and celebrate the small wins and successes because it adds up and that's what sort of dictates the direction of our ship. Okay. And so give me some examples of what that would look like in an accounting firm. 
Sure. So, you know, I think the sort of themes that I tend to see most often uh, circle around a lack of self-awareness. And so thinking that you're coming across in one way, but being received in a completely different way or landing on somebody, uh, you know, in in an emotional way that you weren't anticipating. Mm -hmm. And so this, this idea, like you said, of emotional intelligence or reading the room or not assuming that you've got it right 100% of the time um, is sort of what it all hinges on. And in a lot of the coaching work that I do, I'll prompt people with questions that sort of make them pause and think back and replay some of their interactions and consider all of the other possibilities. You know, how many times have you been in a room, you know, in a meeting with five people and you all hear the same message and yet you all walk out and you're doing different things and you're kind of scratching your head like, how'd that happen? And so making sure that, that people understand how their words land on other people, understand that there are a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of range for interpretation and having that sense of awareness and curiosity so that they can discover what other perspectives might exist at the same time that theirs do. Okay. And how would, let's say, a leader in a firm go about expanding that? Because I think that goes both ways. We would need to look at that and be more that self, have that self-awareness both on a management level, as well as having employees develop that for their future skills, but also in their existing position with their colleagues that they're working with or their peers. So what are some of the tools you've used to help develop that self-awareness and being able to read a room? Because it's always, it, it, that certainly doesn't come easy for everyone. Mm-hmm, for sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, when, when you're in situations where, you know, emotions are high or tensions are high or deadlines are looming, it can be that much harder to, to sort of take that pause, put that space between stimulus and response and really think about what's happening here. What, what biases do I have from my own experiences that might be clouding my ability to see the other perspectives out there? So it, there are two strategies, both of which are very simple, but as we know, simple things are not always easy. <laughs> um, if it were, I would need ice cream every day. But there, the notion of curiosity and, and sort of wondering, huh, what could somebody else be thinking or experiencing, even if I'm you know, certain that I'm experiencing the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. So that notion of curiosity and keeping that alive. And I think the other piece is thinking of the open-ended questions that we as leaders can ask that will really tap into other people's thinking. You know, I love the experiment of looking at people's facial expressions and trying to determine, are they sad, angry, scared, so forth and so on. And depending on, you know, what our backgrounds and sort of embedded biases might be, something that looks angry to one person may look scared, you know, in expression to another. Um, And so sort of having that sense of humility and curiosity and willingness to ask the right open-ended questions and listen are all strategies that, again, are very simple, but hugely impactful as leaders are trying to really understand their populations. Mm. Yeah. You know, in that that presentation we were talking about, about how to have difficult conversations, we did some role play and we went through a scenario like that after talking about how important it is to listen and even to kind of reverbitate what somebody has said and making sure that we're really understanding what they're saying. And we posed a scenario where there was um, someone on the tax team who had missed a deadline for whatever reason. And then we went around the room. Now, understand that this was a group of mostly managing partners of decent sized firms. So we've got management level professionals here, (laughs) mature professionals. And I asked them, I said, okay, here's the scenario. How would you respond to this individual who's missed this tax deadline? And it like eight out of 10 of them did a role play. And, and, Eight out of 10 of them sat down and said, you understand this is inappropriate. I can't believe you missed this deadline. What have you done? Here is the reprimand. If you do this again, we're writing you up. This is the next steps. Here's all of these things to sort of remedy, fix, and argue, you know, what happened. And two out of those 10 thought, maybe I should ask some questions as to what happened. How can we solve this? How can we alleviate this problem? 
And it was amazing because in this particular scenario, there was a reason why that was late that could have been solved. And it was really not entirely that person's fault. That was a scenario that I think, you know, we can see quite often in this space. Do you have any other, um, you know, scenarios? I would love to hear a story of a situation that you've experienced. I'm sure in HR, you've dealt with some things like this where really listening uh, opened your eyes to something that was totally different than what you thought at first glance. Yeah, I mean, the, gosh, there's so many uh, possibilities to draw from. You know, I think especially being in a deadline-driven business, we're going into these interactions thinking, what do I want? And rarely thinking about what's the win-win for the other person and for me and for the client. And, and I think that part of that probably comes from this sense of fear of, I don't want to miss the deadline because then mm -hmm. I'm going to be, you know, in the hot seat or I'm not going to look good. And it misses the human element of things. And I can remember pretty early on, uh, somebody who was working on my team, we would have, you know, regular one-on-ones and she came in and started, you know, kind of going through the normal, um, you know, protocol of what we would discuss. And I, I looked at her, and I said, stop, stop for a minute. I was like, something's wrong. Are you okay? She just burst into tears and this long-term boyfriend, you know, it had been a horrible breakup and she was really just distraught. And it gave me an opportunity to, you know, treat this person that worked on my team as a human rather than a robot. And in that moment, I think it solidified her loyalty to the team, her loyalty to me as her supervisor, her loyalty to the firm, because she knew that I cared and that we could say, let's table this other stuff because I know that you're distraught right now and this is what you need to talk about. And that's, you know, I think a very uncomfortable space for a lot of people who are in technical professions and think, oh, I don't want to deal with tears and I don't even have a box of tissues in, in my office. But that, to your point earlier, we're, we're in the business of working with other human beings and being a human being can be messy. I appreciate that. I had someone give me the response or how would you respond to this, this reply? You expect me to take the time to have these kind of conversations about what's happening in their home life? I don't have time for that. So I'd say replace I don't have time with I don't, it doesn't matter mm. and see how it feels. <laughs> and and see how it, it lands on the other person. See what the retention is like mm -hmm. when you say to that person, I don't care or it doesn't matter. Because mm -hmm. that's essentially what you're saying when you say you don't have time. Wow, that's that's pretty profound. I, I love that. And I think that's so valid because I think we hear that so much anymore that I'm too busy, I don't have time. And if we do flip those words to exactly your point and say, I don't care, that looks entirely different. And when we looked at being, when we look at being proactive, you know, we know through all of the surveys that we do through accounting today and journal accountancy and our own surveys through the Rosenberg survey and, uh, and IPA and all of these things, we pull firms and we pull public and we know what clients want. We know what staff wants too. And of course, we're in this totally different world of staffing now. But we know that clients want service and they want value. It is not just looking at compliance. They want value. That is, what is the value you're bringing to the table in terms of helping me run my business, helping me coaching in these different areas? And as we become more successful and we become seasoned in the profession, we do need to look at that from a consulting standpoint. But when we're not willing to become proactive, that's where we see this shift in the industry as a whole. I was meeting with a firm a couple of weeks ago and was talking about you know, this, this technology that's available to email clients when there is very specific tax legislation that would specifically apply to their business, that we have metrics, we have the ability to kind of track that specifically. This kind of ties to employees as well as where we're, we're more conscientious of what applies to the individual and trying to provide information and knowledge that's helpful for that individual. The response that I got was, are you kidding me? I don't have time to be proactive. We're a reactive firm, and that's all we have time to do. We react to the situations that confront us. We try to get done what we can because it's all we have time for. So I must mean you're seeing and hearing the same arguments because this is what I'm, especially now with staffing, you know, after COVID, everyone's struggling with staffing issues. So what is, what is your kind of coaching or perspective on how to combat that mindset? 
You know, it's so interesting that you asked that question, A, because it's definitely something that sounds familiar, and B, because I, I stumbled upon um, a, a video from Simon Sinek from years ago, and uh, everybody who knows Simon Sinek, he's, you know, this beloved inspirational speaker, and he was talking about how the human brain cannot comprehend the negative. And he says, you know, if I say to you, don't think of an elephant, what do you immediately think of? It's like Dumbo is in your head. And he uses the analogy of a downhill alpine skier. The alpine skier is not thinking, don't hit a tree, don't hit a tree, because then all that they'll see are trees. Mm -hmm. They're thinking, stay to the path, stay to the path. And so the, the lesson here is we tend to, especially as accountants, focus on the corrections the review notes that need to be cleared. Um, it's how we add value to our clients by catching the mistakes and correcting them. But that framework does not work well when you're managing people. In fact, it backfires quite frequently. And so focusing rather on the, you know, instead of saying we can't or we don't have time, focusing on I will or I want to um, and making it more about identity rather than tasks that we do. So asking, you know, firm leaders, what kind of firm leader are you? Are you compassionate? Are you present? Are you able to uh, offer value through connection? Whatever that is, but getting very clear on identity of the individual and of the firm, and then identifying all of the, um, the behaviors, uh, the lead measures that will get you closer to aligning yourself with that identity. That's, I think, the real challenge. Wow. So in a sense, it's like tying back to kind of their intrinsic values underlying, you know, or the principles underlying why they're doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it's identity. It's not tasks. It's not a to-do list. Hmm. That's really interesting. So in your coaching, what are the, what are the biggest areas that you find to be the most difficult for people? I think, you know, the paradigm of I don't have time or I don't have enough time is a big one. Mm -hmm. And so figuring out, you know, how do I manage my notifications better? How do I set up my inbox so that the things I don't have to look at, I don't even see. Mm -hmm. They're automatically filtered out. But also sort of that paradigm shift of everything can't be equally important. If you're going to get five things done this week, what are those five things? blocking out time and respecting that time for those, those tasks. So that's a big one. I think also what I've seen a lot, and, and this may come as a surprise, but is this notion of imposter syndrome and mm -hmm. you know, do I deserve to be here? Am I living up to the expectations? I think that that, that has come up you know, frequently. Of course, the work-life balance you know, is always a conundrum. And I think especially coming back you know, full-fledged to work, um, you know, after COVID, it's like people have this notion that we can come back to the way it was before. And I don't believe that that is the case. I think that we have all been changed. I think we've all experienced on some level, you know, traumatic experience collectively, and we're different now. Mm -hmm. And the world is different. And the way that we interact with that world has to be different too. So we're not ever coming back, in my opinion, to the way that it was before. Mm -hmm. And that's part of this notion of being willing and open and curious about how can we evolve to not only stay competitive, but to stay relevant. Yeah, that's that's such a good, interesting way to look at it as far as a permanent change. And the work-life balance, I agree, I think is shifting. And it's almost serendipitous how I feel like multiple things have sort of merged into this shift. I think COVID certainly was a major catalyst in driving us obviously into more remote work, changing our mindset, changing industries to being much more open to that structure and having less control, I think. And secondarily, you know, my kids are all in their 20s and we look at this generation, these younger generations that are coming up uh, in high school, in college, coming out of college now, and, you know, a lot of what I see is a much more broad focus on that work-life balance, on doing what I love, doing what I feel like is fulfilling, doing what I feel like has meaning, 
and not pushing to a level that I am sacrificing my life, my well-being, my family or other things for the sake of a job. Because so what are some of the areas? Are you coaching some some of your management staff at all on coming to terms with how better to create that 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 allowance for more of that balance? That's such a great topic and great question. Um, I think that it's something that a lot of people struggle with, mm -hmm. um, particularly when there's this uh, notion of, well, I had to do X, Y, and Z to get where I am. And so I'm going to make sure you do X, Y, and Z before you get here too. Exactly. And I keep saying it's like, it's like the previous generation say it's like initiation. I had to do it. Mm -hmm. You need to do it to be initiated and earn your way. Mm -hmm. And and I think the sad thing about it is that, you know, that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, people are confused about why they can't retain talent. You have to change the paradigm for how you treat your people and mm -hmm. what is permissible, what's considered, you know, an acceptable level of effort and work. Because to your point, you know, people have a different set of values. I don't think that it's good or bad. I think that it's different. And certainly, you know, the the paradigm that, you know, about mortality, um, you know, in light of the pandemic, I think particularly working parents. I know I had two very, you know, elementary age school children home when the pandemic hit. And it was probably one of the most stressful times of my entire life. Mm. And it's I think that those types of experiences are traumatic. They change you. They set different boundaries for what you're willing to sacrifice or how much effort you're willing to put in. And I think that the irony about all of that is that if you feel like your leadership or your boss, or your coworkers really genuinely care about you as a human being, you're willing to put in that extra, you know, effort, that, you know, um, discretionary effort, because you know that there are people that you know, like, and trust and that feel the same about you. And so it kind of comes full circle to this idea of we have to be better connected to our teams and our people, and we can't do it on the surface level. Wow. I totally agree. And I think that that connection also is what breeds loyalty, to your point, and retention, because mm -hmm. people care and we do drive bonds. And it's paramount, I think, in, in all business, but particularly in the accounting space, which we both work primarily in. Do you deal much or have you done anything really beginning to look at this holistic approach? You know, my, my focus with this podcast is to shine a big, bright light on the need for more balance and, and sort of opening up that focus on people being aware of not just the needs professionally, but what their personal needs are for their mental health, for their physical health. And allowing mm -hmm. time or taking time and making a commitment to their physical well-being. I do believe that it all blends together to create the whole picture of success. And you kind of have to have all of those things to truly be successful. Do you get into that at all with your coaching to where you're able to really integrate coaching or advice to look in each of those areas, not just their professional management? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, health and well-being is definitely an area of focus for many people um, that you know seek out coaching. And going back to that paradigm of I don't have time and if you replace it with it doesn't matter it just feels very different because mm -hmm. you might say that that's your top priority but you're treating it like it's you know in the lower third at best the other thing that's interesting that I want to kind of come back to is you know you're talking about this employee value proposition basically like if I'm going to be an employee for your firm what are you going to give me in in exchange for my time and talent and effort and you can look at sort of the traditional things while well, I'm paying you a paycheck or I'm offering you benefits, or I'm giving you um, PTO. And all of those things, I mean, from a legal perspective, you have to offer a certain <laughs> bar of those things. But then you look at, you know, what are you doing to advance my learning and my ability to grow and potentially earn more money? Mm -hmm. um, what are you doing to create this sense of community so that I feel like I belong here and I enjoy, you know, interacting with the people that I work with? And, mm -hmm. and it's something that no longer is something that I have to do, but I actually gain benefit from interacting with the people around me. So it's, it's a very, you know, complex system that goes into that employee value proposition. 
I think the other piece of it is that a lot of times, particularly, you know, in financially driven professions, they want to know, well, what's the bottom line? What am I saving? What am I having to spend? Yeah. Um, how do you justify that? And when you look at the, you know, the easiest example of if you have unhealthy employees, what they will spend on your health care versus having healthy employees and what they spend on your health care plans, <laughs> it's a pretty compelling value proposition. And we know that because there are lead measures that contribute to healthy outcomes. We know that exercise and diet and smoking cessation, all of those types of programs that contribute to healthy outcomes, if we have people uh, in our population who are utilizing those resources and have them available and are encouraged to, to utilize them, that they have healthier outcomes and their, their cost to stay healthy or, um, you know, treat diseases that are preventable is a, a big factor. So, you know, when you're when I'm talking to CPA firms who are like, gosh, we don't want to spend one more thing, you know, on our employees. We gave them all gift cards to Barnes & Noble or something or we had dinner delivered or whatever. That that to me is only you know putting a Band-Aid on something. Hmm. You know, if you have an unhealthy population because they feel like they don't have time to exercise or rest or whatever the case may be, you're going to pay for it somewhere along the way. Sure. Well, and that's got to come not only from certain financial incentives, but that's got to be a cultural thing as well, right? If mm -hmm. if the management has a type of perception, if someone goes to the gym and they work out during lunch versus, you know, a different type of perception or how people react to that, ultimately would drive the culture as to whether someone feels like they should do that or they could do that. Or what mm -hmm. that is, because in the industry, something else I've seen and I've talked to a few other people where they almost feel guilty. Like, well, I don't have time to go to the gym. I feel guilty just going and that's so selfish. I'm going to spend an hour you know, on the treadmill or something. And I'm, I've got 10 tax returns sitting on my desk and I've got to return four phone calls for this client. And I can't just take this time for myself. I mean, you know, how selfish can I get? So how do you combat that mentality? Because that is definitely something that I think as professionals with a heavy workload, we battle that every day. One of the strategies that I use in coaching is to have the person get up out of their chair and sit in a different chair and say, okay, now you're your daughter or your son. And who do you want to be for your daughter or your son? You want to be healthy, active, engaged. Is sitting here for the 10th hour of your day doing a tax return or responding to a client email going to achieve the outcome of being a healthy, engaged parent? Or is going on a 15-minute walk before you regroup on your work going to achieve the outcome of being a healthy, engaged parent? Mm -hmm. And then moving around the room. Okay, so let's move over to this chair. This chair is your spouse or your mom. How do you want to show up for that person? Is your decision or your behavior supporting the way that you want to show up for that person? So having this sort of multidimensional view, not only of the world around us, but also of ourselves, we are not one dimensional. We are very complex beings. And I think to simplify it, to say it's selfish for me not to do anything other than the work that's in front of me reduces us to being a robot. And that's not what we are. Wow. Yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, you're right. That would reduce us to being robots, you know, very task oriented. And that's that's a, a great point. Great perspective. Have you seen any specific mechanisms or tools that firms have put in place to encourage staff to take a break, to do something, you know, physical maybe, or maybe it's just even mental by, you know, allowing them to go out of the office for a certain period of time, sort of step away. Have you seen any firm start to implement things like that? Yeah, the firm that I worked for previously implemented um, a five-day break during busy season. I know that there are like people whose jaws have just fallen on the floor and they're picking them up right now. So I'll give them a minute. But it worked really well. And it essentially allowed people to take three weekdays off with a weekend. So five day break um, during busy season. And they would schedule it ahead of time, sort of first come, first serve, get on the calendar and be able to have this exercise of planning for being out, delegating responsibility setting up contingency plans, and then being able to come back in and sort of, you know, come back hitting the ground running, but feeling rejuvenated and rested. Hmm. 
And so that was something that, you know, was kind of a radical experiment many, many years ago. Um, but as far as I know, they're still um, doing that. And that's a huge differentiator when you go to recruiting events to say, hey, guess what we offer during busy season? Because very firm, a few firms offer that. The other thing that I see, and this is maybe less so about physical health and well-being, but more so about allowing people to capitalize on uh, work that requires really deep focus. Um, so this notion of focus time, you, know, you think about how many times you are interrupted during the course of the day, whether it's, you know, a, the phone ringing, an email ding, um, some other notification, somebody knocking on your door asking if you have a minute, even though, you know, they're probably going to be in your office for an hour, <laughs> whatever it is. You know, there was an article several years ago that talked about, you know, what's the average number of hours that somebody loses in a day because of interruptions? And it was six hours, something absurd. Wow. And part of that is that the human brain is not made to focus very deeply on something, get distracted, and then come right back to that deep point of focus. It takes a very long time for us to get back into that deep point of focus. And that's, that's just simply brain science. That's not, you know, I wish that was something that I made up, but it's not. And this idea of focus time is where you block off, we'll say two hours, where everybody in an organization um, is focusing on tasks that require deep, uninterrupted focus. And so um, whether it's looking at financials, um, reviewing very complicated code, whatever the case may be, you schedule those types of tasks during those blocks of time. There's no internal meetings, no internal phone calls or emails. You basically turn off all of those other distractions and have that time to focus on that particular project that you've segmented into that part of your day. And so it's, I get a lot of pushback on it. It seems totally radical, but the firms who do it are really able to capitalize on that benefit of having all of their people be able to do their highest and best work during that focus time. Absolutely. I know we've done a couple of trainings on that internally to really look at how to utilize Outlook, how to limit limitations, how often to check mail. And it, it's amazing because I think so few people do that. But when we talked about that, really looking at taking control and initiative of our daily tasks and our daily and weekly plans to have intention with what we do rather than just simply reacting, because it's so easy. Uh, like the conversation I mentioned earlier, the CPA says, look, all we have time to do is react. And we are essentially controlled by what's being thrown at us at every moment, you know, those emails, those things. Um, but but we can take, take control. And I, I appreciate that perspective and definitely the coaching on that. Uh, and I can vouch for the fact that, you know, these programs have been incredible. I know you guys have helped so many people really improve their overall function and, and organization with that. So then now to call you out personally, I know that you are very active. Um, I know that you're, you're, I mean, you're very healthy. I, I believe, I think you run marathons or something. What, what is your secret? I would love to know what you do and how you manage to keep that a priority in your life, given that you have a successful career, you have two young children at home, how do you do that? And and then tell us what you do. I'm I'm curious to know what you're doing on a daily basis. Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I've always enjoyed being active and I think it it has sort of physical benefits, but also mental well-being benefits and stress management benefits, um, all of which contribute to why I stick with it. Are there days where I don't want to? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, sort of that easy trick of I'm gonna do this for 10 minutes. I'm gonna you know, row on the rower or walk on the treadmill for 10 minutes. And if after that, I still am not into it, that's fine. But usually what happens is that you sort of have that switch moment and you're into it. And so, you know, I think that it's important to find something that you enjoy, whether that's walking your dog or swimming or whatever it might be. I mean, I've tried probably every kind of exercise out there just out of curiosity. And there's some things that I know I don't like and I'm not going to stick with them you know, dance classes, Zumba, any kind of choreography, I know that I'm not going to stick with that because I don't really enjoy it. I have some friends at the Pilates studio where I've, I've gotten certified recently who are trying to get me to do a trampoline class. And <laughs> I know I'm going to at some point, but it, it's a little scary. 
So I think, you know, just scheduling time, you know, whether it's signing up for a class or looking at the forecast and saying, gosh, you know, Sunday afternoon looks like an amazing day for running outside um, and planning your week around that, knowing that that is something that is essential and non-negotiable, you know, and I've actually, I feel like I'm at the point now in my life where if I do miss a workout, I'm kind of bummed, Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's tough to give that up. But yeah, right now, I mean, I'm a Peloton rider. Um, love Robin Arsan for any of the Peloton riders out there. I, you know, teach and do Pilates. I run periodically and um, just kind of keep it, you know, switched up and interesting. Hot yoga is great. I think activities that complement one another so that you're not always just weightlifting or always just doing stretching, mm-hmm. you know, things that kind of give you that variety um, work for me. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. You've got a little recovery and a little of both on on both sides. Have you always been focused on that? I mean, your whole life or what what pushed you into that active lifestyle? Yeah, um, you know, it's funny. I have flashbacks to when I used to play field hockey uh, in seventh grade. And, um, you know, my dad would say to my sister and me, I don't care what sport you play, but you got to play something. And so I tried out for the field hockey team and Little did I know that it was a lot of running and I hated it at the time, but I really loved winning field hockey games. And so, you know, with any sport, it's the drills and the practicing that gets you good when you're actually in game time. Um, And so it's I think it's so many applications of the sports uh, metaphor are true for life. You know, it's all of the little things that you do that add up to big successes. And if you're not willing to put in the time to do the drills or do the practices and, you know, believe in the process, you're not going to yield the same level of results. Yeah, for sure. So do you actually block time on your calendar for your workout times? I do. Mm -hmm. Wow. I think that's unusual. And I think that's probably such a smart thing to do (laughs) because I know my calendar gets filled up before I even know what happened. Um, And then the workout does tend to be the last thing. And it's sort of the first thing out if if it gets filled up with other work because we think those other priorities are more important. Do you ever feel guilty if you are committing to a time where you're going to say, you know, I'm going to run at this time or, or I'm working out for this period of time? Do you ever feel guilty about maybe that you're not doing something with your kids or something with your spouse or something, you know, answering some emails that you feel like you should be doing at that time? You know, it's interesting. I mean, every audience I think I want to show up, you know, authentically with. And I think about my kids and setting the example that it's important for me to take care of my body physically as well as, you know, the foods that we eat. So I actually take a lot of pride in having my kids see me, you know, hop on the Peloton before I'm driving them to school in the morning or, you know, at night, you know, when they're doing their homework. And They've almost gotten to the point. The other day, my daughter asked me, Mom, aren't you going to do a bike ride? I was like, oh, okay. Um, I was like, no, I wasn't going to. I was going to eat popcorn with you on the couch. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, and, and I think from a work perspective, too, it's like you have to be flexible. It's like if I had planned on going for a run and a client calls and needs something or, you know, one of my colleagues calls and needs something, I have to be flexible and in the moment reprioritize my time. So you know, sure, there are days where things get moved around, but I try to schedule it for times where I think I can be pretty um, certain that it'll happen. You know, if I know that I'm going to get up early and work out, I'm going to go to bed early. Um, And I've been disciplined about that for several decades now, you know, going to bed by 10 if I know I'm going to get up at six. Wow. I, I respect that so much. And I agree. I think it's interesting because I started doing yoga years ago before I even had an app and before I really knew what it was. And I was too embarrassed to go to a studio because I was really self-conscious and I'm tall and skinny. And so I always feel like people look at me funny. <laughs> and so it's a huge insecurity. So I started to do yoga at home and then they did start to develop apps and I had like an app and I would just try to do it. And I was actually thinking the other day that my daughter now is 20. How old is she? She's 23. And she is an avid yogi. Like, I mean, twice a day yoga. She she is obsessed with it. Um, It's totally her thing. But I was reflecting back on the fact that, gosh, you know, it's just so weird because we don't even realize how much our kids see, what they're observing, and that it does formulate for them what the norm is. 
And that's a great perspective to remember that maybe it isn't always just about our physical health as well. It is. But on the other hand, too, we could be really creating that perception for our family and those around us to really focus on those things. So I really respect that you take the time and you commit to that. And it's a part of your daily schedule. One last point is in in another earlier podcast I did with Steve Adams, he's a CPA and he was overweight and just started walking. And he used the very similar analogy you used at the beginning of our conversation about making deposits in your 401k and then understanding kind of the growth of that over time. And he used the same analogy when he started to commit to just walking. He said, I'm just going to walk around the block every night after work. I have to do something. And he just committed to that. It was one block every single night. And over time, it grew and grew and grew until he was running like long distances years later because he was making these deposits in his bank account. And so I just thought it was really interesting. You used that analogy very similar to what Steve was sharing with us. But We're at the end of our time, so I don't want to keep you, but I'm so happy to have had the conversation, Sarah, and you offer so much value with your coaching through the growth partnership and the programs available. You do a lot of public speaking as well. I know in consulting overall in in HR-related issues, staffing issues, and and, um, personal development coaching. Can you give us your contact information? If someone has questions and wants to talk to you, how can they reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think probably the best way is, is via email. So it's just S Huddleston, H-U-D-D-L-E-S-T-O-N at thegrowthpartnership.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as well um, and happy to connect with anyone who has questions or wants to get more information about all of the awesome programs and, and offerings that we have. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. We'll share your contact information in links on the podcast site as well. But thank you so much for your insights. I love talking to you and hearing about what you're seeing and some of the um, solutions that you guys have developed. So I hope you have a wonderful afternoon and thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Heidi. It was a joy to be here.